Today, I'm delighted to welcome uh, colleagues to present on two different topics, and we have a bit of a, a Dutch theme here. So um, uh, very much welcoming Dr. Robbie Newlat uh, from McMaster University and Dr. Rob Wust from uh, Amsterdam, the Free University in the Netherlands. Thank you so much for coming. And just one other note about logistics. Uh, the cameras and the mics are off, but the chat is open. So I do encourage you to post your questions as we go through the presentations. And then we will pause for questions and discussion at the end of each presentation. And we'll do our best to answer as many as we can, but uh, we may not get to all of them. So um, please, uh, both Drs. Uh, Ravi and Dr. Rob, feel free to answer in the chat as well as you can. These sessions are recorded, and with permission from the speakers, we will be posting them online uh, as, as soon as possible after the webinar. And as always, we welcome your thoughts about how these sessions can be more helpful to you. So thanks, everyone, and we will get started uh, with Dr. Nulat. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, let me share my slides. All right. Um... Thanks very much to Long COVID Web for giving the opportunity to present here and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so I'm presenting today on the Canadian guidelines for post COVID-19 condition, or also known as CAN-PCC. Um, and my name is uh, Robin Newlat, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, the CAN-PCC executive committee, as well as uh, also all our collaborators. Uh, and also, of course, important to mention, uh, these, the development and implementation and evaluation of these guidelines, uh, the whole project is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Before I go into uh, the content, here are just some disclosures for myself. I'm co-leading the project together with Dr. Holger Schunemann. Uh, I'm a social professor at McMaster University. And you can see here my other disclosures, including uh, the in-guide program, which trains people to be, get involved in uh, guideline development. So CAN PCC consists primarily of three components. So we are uh, developing guidelines and guideline recommendations. We are also doing knowledge mobilization uh, to get these recommendations taken up into practice. So that's dissemination and implementation. And the third component is uh, evaluation to evaluate to what extent um, People are aware of them, are using them in practice, or are taking them to their healthcare providers, for example. So these are the three main components of the project. Here are some of our main principles, and I'll walk through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, we develop evidence-based guidelines covering the full spectrum of post-COVID-19 condition, and I'll get to the specific topics related to that. Uh, we, were, uh, we are aiming for balanced representation of interested participants in decision-making roles, as well as um, supporting roles or consulting roles, including residents from different provinces and territories, uh, people with lived experience, as well as equity-deserving groups. Key groups and collaborators are involved, including prominent guideline development organizations. So we, we are trying to make this relevant not just, of course, primarily for Canada, but we're also collaborating internationally so we can set an example and be the standard internationally as well. Uh, we are using a transparent and systematic approach based on best practices for guideline development and informed by the best available evidence. We have independent management of conflicts of interest. It's a really important part of developing guidelines. Uh, potential conflicts should be managed. And uh, as I already mentioned on the previous slide, we have a standardized training program that's called InGuide, uh, through which we are uh, training people to get involved in various roles in guideline development. You can see here a bit of a, an extensive uh, overview of our organization for the whole project. Um, I'll highlight a few things here. So we are uh, the Cochrane Canada and McMaster uh, grade centers uh, combined. Our faculty members, so myself and Holger and others are situated there. We uh, get input from an international advisory board. Uh, we have a guideline development group, which is uh, the overarching decision-making group to uh, develop and finalize the recommendations. We have guideline teams, six, uh, so one for each topic, and I'll get to the topics. 
uh, who are developing drafting recommendations that will then be signed off on by the guideline development group. We are working with evidence synthesis teams that are um, systematically looking for and synthesizing the, uh, the evidence supporting the recommendations. We have a knowledge mobilization committee uh, that Susan is also a part of. So we have, uh, we work together, uh, we keep each other informed with long COVID web. And you can see on the right, we also are working with other stakeholder groups, uh, a public member panel, and an equity oversight committee. Here you can see uh, in a simple overview of what we've done so far and what we are going to do next. We have selected our priority topics. Uh, we have developed good practice statements, so initial 11 statements that are on our website right now. Um, we are prioritizing the specific guideline questions we will address with formal recommendations, as well as the health outcomes that will be addressed for each of them. We have started to do the evidence synthesis work to look for the best available evidence to answer these questions and make create recommendations. Uh, and so the development of the recommendations by the guideline teams and guideline development group is about to start based on that evidence synthesis work. Here you can see uh, the overview of the six topics we're covering for the full cycle of post-COVID-19 condition. Um, there's quite a bit of text in there, so I'll highlight the topics themselves and what we're addressing uh, in an overarching way. So we have, we address prevention of post-COVID-19 condition, testing, identification, and diagnosis related to PCC. I'm going to call PCC from here on. Um, pharmacological and non-pharmacological clinical interventions, neurological and psychiatric topics related to PCC, pediatric and adolescent topics related to PCC, as well as healthcare services, systems, and social support. So these are the six guideline teams that are working on these specific topics. And uh, across them, we are addressing management, monitoring and follow-up, prevention of other conditions related to PCC. And uh, across all of them, we are taking into account equ equity-deserving groups. And I'll also come back to that for the overall project. As mentioned, we have published already 11 good practice statements. They were released on January 16. Um, they were released first to urgently address common challenges that uh, people with PCC have in practice uh, or for prevention. We will add uh, formal recommendations in the coming months. As I said, we have started to uh, find the evidence and we are starting to create the recommendations. Here you can see for questions and outcomes what we are uh, doing right now. So in terms of questions, each guideline team, so per each of the six topics, we're going to address 15 questions that are important in practice. Uh, we have received input from the public, so probably from a lot of you as well, uh, and Canadian and international interest groups to uh, then decide based on that input what are the 15 most important questions to address for each of them. Uh, in terms of identifying the most important health outcomes, we typically uh, address seven health outcomes per question because it's very hard to consider uh, many more outcomes than that to make a decision if a recommendation goes for or against an option. Uh, we are considering people important outcomes. So what matters is really important, not what is reported in research studies, for example. Uh, of course, we need to find the evidence, but it re we really need to know what outcomes matter to people affected by PCC or at risk of PCC. So uh, PCC is a broadly defined condition associated with many outcomes or health states. So we are going through a process to identify among them which seems to be the which seem to be the most critical and most important outcomes. We are working off a core outcome set that was developed specifically for PCC, and we are using health outcome descriptors uh, for a common understanding among recommendation developers, researchers, and guideline users in terms of what it means to experience this specific outcome. And here, uh, there's just one example of that, uh, how we approach this. So this example is about quality of life impairment as an outcome that's important for your decision-making about your care. And we address the symptoms that you may experience, the time horizon, how long this may affect you, what kind of testing and treatment you would undergo if you experience this, 
and what are the longer term consequences. So we are creating this uh, for all outcomes that we that are potentially important. Just a bit more about how we uh, develop recommendations and specifically what type of information we consider for that. We have a framework that's called an evidence to decision framework, and it structures the group consensus process to make judgments and uh, create recommendations. And you can see from the overview here that we are looking at importance of the problem, um, health effects, so we distinguish desirable, so positive uh, health effects and undesirable, so negative effects. We look at the certainty of the evidence that we found. We are looking at importance of the outcomes, as I mentioned. Then we look at the balance of effects. But we also consider resource use and cost effectiveness. We consider equity, so effects on health equity, as well as acceptability and feasibility in terms of uh, using the intervention or the option in practice. A little bit more about the equity approach in CAMPCC. Uh, this is the first large guideline development project with an established equity oversight committee that will work across all the guideline teams and will provide input and is providing input for uh, the different steps involved in the guideline development as well as implementation. Uh, and so this was also, their input was also used for the good practice statements release. And we are following a seven step framework um, to apply this across the CAM PCC teams. And this is what it looks like. So first of all, uh, we want to identify disadvantaged populations that may particularly be affected. Uh, we will examine the available data we uh, find by our systematic process to see to what extent uh, data or analyses are reported for these specific subgroups. We evaluate their baseline risk. Are they uh, at higher risk for certain outcomes than perhaps the general population? We assess representation, um, for example, among the uh, identified studies for our evidence, we can see if certain populations perhaps were excluded, either explicitly or implicitly somehow by using certain criteria. Uh, we appraise the analyses, so across uh, reported um, groups according to appropriate assessment methods. We note implementation barriers, so if this is reported on, if there are certain barriers preventing people from uh, receiving care, receiving certain interventions or tests, this information will also be captured. And we will suggest implementation strategies as part of our KM component to uh, tailor implementation for these uh, equity groups if there are different barriers at work uh, as compared to the general population. So as I've already mentioned, we have a knowledge mobilization component as well. And here I'll just give you a, a quick overview and a bit of a flavor of what this involves. So here, this is an overview of projects. We have a geographical reach with several of our projects, uh, three among Canada, one in Saskatchewan, one in Quebec, one in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, in terms of involvement of equity groups in these projects, you can see here uh, which ones they would um, incorporate. And you can see uh, two projects include all of them. And then there are some more focused projects for specific equity groups. And some examples of our activities are workshops, outreach visits. Um, I won't go through the full list, but uh, podcasts and uh, hopefully also integrate integration in care systems and processes. Here's one example of a project that we are going to uh, conduct. Um, it's an example of to enhancement of my guide for long COVID. It's an online resource, as you can see here, that's already existing for self-management. Uh, it's a guide for patients and it's created after the answer a series of initial questions. So this will uh, be also tailored for CAN PCC recommendations uh, related to self-care. And it will make it more accessible to individuals from other provinces, uh, non-English speakers and persons with impairments and caregivers. And it will be promoted to uh, providers, healthcare providers, as well as participants with post-COVID-19 condition and their uh, direct caregivers. Then as a final slide, here you can see what our communication strategy is. Uh, we just want to highlight that. So we have email communications, we send out 
messages fed to federal, provincial organizations, as well as long COVID clinics to receive our information and our requests for input, which we've done at several times now for public input. Uh, and to CAN PCC project groups, as well as people who agree to be contacted for our, for our project. Uh, we are present on social media, as you can see here. And in terms of collaborations, um, we sent uh, messages to health organizations with a large audience to seek interest and resharing our guidelines and for collaboration. So there are many different things going on, and uh, I hope this gives you an idea of, of uh, how much we are doing in the overall project. So that is the final slide for me. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, as Susan said, I'm happy to take questions and answer any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Ravi. We have we definitely have some time now for questions. Um, there was a, a early question in the chat about uh, vaccine related symptoms. Do you want to just uh, uh, mention how that might be related to the work that you're doing on guidelines and best practice statements? Um, what what is the exact question, Susan? Uh, just about um, uh, the inclusion or exclusion of uh, um, e evidence uh, around people receiving uh, or having symptoms from uh, vaccines themselves. Would that be a particular exclusion criteria, or is is long COVID um, from any source uh, is considered in the evidence you're looking at? Yes, yeah, so um, at this point, I think we're looking at um, anyone who would uh, fill, you know, fulfill the criteria to be considered suspected or confirmed post-COVID-19 condition or at risk because we have a prevention guideline team as well, right? Um, and vaccination tends to be a, a risk factor or being unvaccinated tends to be a risk factor for to put you at higher risk for developing post-COVID. Uh, so at this point, I would say this is being uh, considered. I'm not sure to what extent this will lead to specific recommendations related to that. Thank you. So another question about how the guidelines and um, uh, the best practice statements work when we are um, a provincial have provincial jurisdictions. How how will the information uh, be used by the different uh, provinces and territories, or how are you hoping that they're used? So in terms of our knowledge mobilization, so we have, first of all, we um, put a lot, lot of effort into dissemination. So on our website, we have the good practice statements that you can see them in a, in a recommendation map. So in a map overview, um, we are creating tools, uh, especially also for the formal recommendations that are coming up next. So such as plain language recommendations, patient decision aids, we're aiming for different tools that may help uh, to be taken up in practice. And we really are aiming to distribute that as widely as possible because dissemination, uh, now we have these many contacts in Canada of different organizations who, who we have established connections with uh, and you know with the public on our website. So through our website, you can find anything that we've produced. Uh, we really try to distribute it as widely as possible. So it gets to the, to the target audience. So the people who should be using or who are affected by the recommendations. Great, thanks. Uh, another question um, about uh, accommodation and supports that you're using or implementing to ensure that disadvantaged populations or equity seeking groups are, um, are, are physically and cognitively able to participate in the processes that you've described. Yeah, th that's a great point. So uh, we've gone through a selection process whereby we, uh, we've identified patient representatives who are on our uh, guideline development group, our guideline teams, as well as our equity uh, oversight committee, knowledge mobilization committee, so in the different groups. Um, and their participation, so the meetings are largely online, like now. Um, we try to accommodate them as good as possible in terms of you know having breaks. Uh, we have very few uh, in-person longer meetings, but for those uh, meetings, for example, we, we've had them for our guideline development group, and there we try to accommodate uh, the persons with post-COVID-19 condition or lived experience that they have an opportunity to take a rest or whatever is needed for them to, to be engaged, but not to overburden them. Okay, thanks. And there's a specific question about um, uh, groups from neurodivergent or hypermobile individuals. Are there uh, are there specific strategies for those groups, or is that included in what you've just mentioned? 
I think it's uh, it's more um, a personal approach. So we try to reach out to people to determine to what extent they are able to uh, to be engaged, to participate actively, uh, and what is required for them to, uh, to yeah to make that happen. And it it really it would depend on the person. So yeah, it's not one specific um, subgroup. No. Okay. Thanks. Uh, there's a question about how uh, to locate long COVID clinic locations, and I know that other resources do have those listed and um, by province or territory or jurisdiction. And uh, at Long COVID Web, we are trying to put together a list of resources that will hopefully be, be on our website that might be able to help answer that question. Um, I don't know, if Robbie, if you have any suggestions there about finding out where the clinics are. So we don't have that overview uh, at present. Um, I'm not sure, but perhaps your website will be the best resource uh, at some point. Um, I'm not sure where to find the overview for all the provinces and territories, but that's a great point, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something we should look into, yeah. Great. Now there's a question about how uh, provinces and territories, some don't uh, accept uh, that um, SARS-CoV-2 is spread by aerosols and still re recommend hand washing uh, against uh, airborne virus. Um, so the first good practice that you have, how, how are you hoping or expecting it to be more than wishful thinking? So in terms of getting this uh, improved in practice, that more people are washing their hands in, in any setting or in the healthcare setting. Um, About bringing people up to date, really. Yeah. On current ways to remember. Right. I, I think so our, by addressing the most pressing questions, most important questions in practice by our guideline teams, I think it will be, they, they will go by their current understanding, right? So then, uh, for example, perhaps air ventilation may be addressed and, and hand washing may not be addressed. Uh, doesn't mean it's not important. We have to make a choice. We only have limited resources and time to address specific, uh, you know, recommendations or create a certain number of recommendations. But by that prioritization, it will be clear what what's being considered, what is being considered more important right now in practice, uh, as opposed to maybe some other questions. Right. So the next one is a, a question about the. Um... Uh, the constitution of your um, prevention focus group. It seems that there are not many occupational health and safety specialists, occupational hygienists, engineers, or biomathematicians in that group. Um, and this person is saying that uh, that this would be essential for including including them in informing your evidence synthesis. Um, do you have thoughts about how to gather that sort of input or expertise? Yeah, no, um, great point. I think we gather these groups to try to represent as many different perspectives that are relevant for the specific topic. Um, it will never be perfect, but uh, I would have, in terms of occupational health, I know they are represented in other teams. I'm not exactly sure for prevention, so that's something I can look at. I do know for they're planning to address air ventilation and filtration. And um, one option we have is even if somebody is not a voting member on the guideline team, we can ask for experts to join meetings, to provide more context, provide their expert input, so the, the guideline team better understands what the evidence means. Right, uh, another question about dissemination, um, in particular for uh, family doctors and, and general practitioners and uh, pediatric uh, physicians. Um, are you, do you have any particular implementation or dissemination strategies for those groups? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, we obviously we consider this group very important because we have a specific guideline team for them. It's a it's a separate topic: uh, children and adolescents. Um, the knowledge mobilization for this group will be different. Uh, I mean, we are just simply disseminating our products as widely as possible uh, as we can. But if for this group, um, you know, caregivers, uh, parents, they, it will be important to make sure that they get the information that's relevant um, besides the children or adolescents themselves, but for, for smaller children, especially, we need to look at what specifically can we do to reach them. Um, right now, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I think um, for each guideline team, we are looking at how can we make sure that that specific target audience gets our recommendations. Yep. Great, thank you. 
I see that some people are actually helping with uh, some answers um, and some back and forth in the chat. That's terrific. Um, I'm just jumping down now. Uh, what other studies will be coming um, <clears throat> around pharmaceuticals and other supplements? Uh, what treatments will you be specifically looking at? So right now, our guideline teams are still finalizing the process to, to pick those final 15 questions that they are going to address with recommendations. So for which we're going to look for the evidence and then create a recommendation. Uh, so I cannot uh, confirm which ones they are, but we're very close to finalizing them. So once once they are available, we will share them. Uh, right now, I don't want to pin us down on specific questions because there may, there may still be a few changes here or there. But we do have a uh, one guideline team on pharmacological, non-pharmacological clinical interventions for PCC. And so if there are any interventions that are considered uh, very important in practice right now, then they would probably be addressed there. Although uh, we also have our topic on neurological psychiatric topics. So uh, there will be some interventions in there as well. Great, thanks. And a question from someone who um, has a particular situation and would like to be volunteering and uh, participating and engaging in some of this research. Do you have suggestions for engagement in the type of work you're doing, Robbie? Yeah, so we have, uh, I showed you the organizational chart with all the different groups that we're working with. So we've gone through a, you know, fairly uh, extensive process to identify people to take applications, uh, go through a selection process, put these groups together. So that's where we are right now. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be involved, because even if you're not a member of one of these groups, you can still contribute by responding to uh, public calls. So if we have uh, if we have a public call to provide input on our um, questions or outcomes, but more likely uh, in the next month, you will see draft recommendations on our website for which we ask uh, the public to review them and provide feedback before they are finalized. So that's a very helpful way to, to be engaged in this process, I would say, at this point. Great. Uh, and last question. Um, it's a sort of a more uh, practical cl uh, clinical question, but I'm just wondering if you would have a comment on um, whether or not people who have long COVID or are long hauler could infect others with COVID. So that is uh, not a question I can answer. Uh, I wouldn't pretend to be uh, an expert on that specific topic. So uh, apologies if that's disappointing. Um, what we, I'm not sure if that will be, a, let's say, a question or part of a consideration of one of our recommendations. Um, it is a very interesting one, so I'll take that back, and and I can ask our guideline teams if this is uh, if they are considering that. That's great, thanks, Robbie. We can also take that on at Long COVID Web about um, in our, our list of resources to think about uh, some of the facts and figures that would be helpful for common questions like that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we'll turn to our second speaker now, Dr. Rob Wust. Over to you uh, about fatigue and long COVID. Yes, good afternoon or evening here from the Netherlands. Um, thanks a lot for the uh, invitation again to speak. And it's uh, it's indeed a Dutch, full Dutch uh, uh, a team, but um, I hope that uh, I also can um, share with you some of the work that we've been doing on skeletal muscle changes and, uh, and the link we see with um, with post exertional malaise in patients with long COVID. <clears throat> so the first thing I really need to do is to highlight the the, the contribution of the full team that we uh, that, that we are uh, that we that we have here in Amsterdam. Um, we we share this project together with a, a, a set of clinicians uh, in the hospital in the local hospital, Amsterdam UMC where uh, clinicians really highlighted a problem that we that we are tr trying to address uh, in this particular presentation. And then in, in our lab, uh, you see the bottom uh, the bottom right is our building where we do all our research. We have a, a, a really a cool team of, of young scientists. And I have to admit that, um, that because it's a Canadian uh, audience, I do really need to highlight uh, one Canadian in specific because the project has been mainly driven by a Canadian uh, PhD student, Braden, who is now uh, also one of the ME stars of tomorrow. He's been selected to one of the uh, uh, ME stars from the, uh, the ICANN uh, ME uh, uh, network. So uh, he's from Vancouver. Uh, so the project has a, a big Canadian flag on it. And uh, that's something that, uh, that I think needs to be highlighted here. Um, 
So we are also actively searching or uh, trying to, uh, to 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 link our research with the local Canadian uh, uh, people. So just to get an idea about the, the topic of the, the, the presentation, uh, mildly infected patients are generally do not recover and can develop extreme fatigue. You see some examples here we, with permission from these, from the, from, from their, um, uh, from these patients that the main, and the main problem that they have is not that they're just feeling fatigued, but actually their, ex, their, their physical function worsens or the, 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 all their symptoms worsen with exercise. And that's something that is really interesting. However, not all not all long COVID patients that are typically that we typically think as having persisting problems after um, after an, an, an initial infection do have this particular um, uh, symptom. So these are sort of three different directions where we think uh, long COVID long COVID patients can fall into. In of course, if you have if you have been hospitalized, if you if you are deconditioned, um, if you do get um, uh, long COVID and are having an acute infection, of course you do not recover properly after after three months, and you may not even get back to the same level. That same happens to uh, the age population or patients with with comorbidities. So a typical long COVID patient may not suffer from post exertional malaise, is what we will discuss later on, or muscle fatigue and weakness. And, and, and that's something that really needs to be highlighted, that only a specific subgroup of patients. And actually, if you look into, that, into the, the details, it can be actually quite a big portion of the typical post-COVID condition or long COVID patients that suffer from uh, the symptom called post exertional malaise. And that's what we are diving into in this presentation. So post-exertional malaise is uh, is one of the main or key symptoms that patients from long COVID uh, suffer from. As I mentioned, fatigue, general fatigue, but also worsening of symptoms after a bout of uh, uh, either high or low intensity exercise. It depends a bit on the threshold at what at where post-exertional malaise is being in, initiated or induced. Um, patients do get a worsening of all these symptoms that are listed here. Uh, after exercise. So it's not only that act, that fatigue is worsened or that patients are feeling fatigued, it's actually more than that. But the problem is a little bit that we always think, and I'm an exercise physiologist, uh, they always think that exercise is good for you, but actually that's not the case. So medicine or exercise is not medicine in some patients. In the particular patient population where we are, uh, where we see is PEM uh, being uh, occurring. So we, we don't really know what their underlying mechanism is and why these people are not recovering or get better after rehabilitative exercise. It's also important to remember that exercise, that, that PEM is not the same as fatigue only. It's more than that. But the, the, the underlying pathophysiology essentially is, is virtually unknown. So what we did in our in our Amsterdam study was to to um, do a uh, to induce post exertional malaise using a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Now we know, of course, that is that that that, that is intense and that's uh, that, that's limiting uh, daily exercise of daily daily functioning of patients. Um, but rather than doing the standard two day cardiopulmonary exercise test to to detect. To detect the, uh, the post exertional malaise, what we opted is to do a two day biopsy experiment. So, before the exercise test, we took a muscle biopsy, and one day after the induction of post exertional malaise, we took another muscle biopsy that was followed with blood, questionnaires, etc., to really find out what inside the skeletal muscle and inside the body is going on during uh, a bout of post exertional malaise. And because we are one of the first ones to, to really do this, we didn't really know what to look for. Um, uh, these are the participant characteristics, by the way, before we go into the, the results. But um, the patients were diagnosed based on interviews and medical history. The inclusion criteria were that, that they had to in, have some post exertional malaise and minimum three months of persisting symptoms. All our healthy controls recovered from an acute uh, COVID-19 infection, and patients could not participate if they were hospitalized or if they had other comorbidities that could explain their fatigue. So these are the, 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 the characteristics. We have a very um, um, 
relatively young population, 43 years old, um, but weight and, and, and age were, were, were matched. Also sex was matched, so 50-50% was, uh, was male and female. As I mentioned, we didn't really know what to look for, and we, we thought, let's first look at the exercise capacity. Then we dive into some of the, uh, the, 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 the suggested theories that, or hypotheses that people put forward where, where PEM could have related to or how that could be explained. And we focus on skeletal muscle mitochondrial function. Um, there's a theory about microclots we'll dive into. And also we thought maybe there are some pathological features um, of, of, of exercise induced uh, damage that could explain our results. The last thing with our persistence is an ongoing thing in the in the literature and we really wanted to understand whether far persistence can explain some of the fatigue pro, uh, profiles that we see so let's see let's look at the exercise intolerance so this is the the, the study that we published recently in uh, uh, nature communications and there we um, we we described that there indeed is an exercise intolerance occurring in patients with or exercise reduce excess capacity in patients. But if you look at the, 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 the figure E in the bottom, we also see that there is a fiber type distribution of shift occurring in patients. So patients have slightly whiter type of tissue, uh, muscle, muscle tissue, that makes these muscles more fatigable, just in, a, in the standard condition, not after. Uh, uh, that's a structural change that we see in the skeletal muscle that can, can explain their reduce exercise capacity. You can help to expand exercise capacity. The other thing that we saw, if you look at uh, figure F, and, uh, is that if we look at the muscle size of the muscle on the, y, on the X axis and the peak power that the, these people can produce on the bike, we see there is a downward shift, so suggesting that for the same muscle size, the pa patients cannot get the same type of um, um, uh, exercise performance. And particularly, we, we wanted to see whether the mitochondrial function was impaired. And indeed, we do see a, like a, an enzyme for the oxidative metabolism on the, in figure, figure G, G, where we don't see many differences occurring between patients and controls, but we do see that they don't correspond to their maximum exercise capacity that, that we see on the bike, suggesting that there is indeed something wrong with their skeletal muscle metabolism. So we dove further into, into the mitochondrial aspects of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the study. So here on the left-hand side, you see our mitochondrial respiration measurement. So how much ATP, how much energy the muscle is able to produce. And in red, you see the long COVID patients and in white, our healthy controls before and after induction of the post exertion malaise. And we do see that, the, that there is a, a general reduction in their respiration one day after exercise. But if you look at, at that, that figure B, the difference in the mitochondrial activity is, 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 is becoming bigger after exercise, while the control patients generally did better after exercise or, or did, not in, did not decrease. We did see a reduction in their mitochondrial enzyme activity upon, in, upon the uh, PEM. We also saw differences in the, meta, uh, the meta, uh, metabolome uh, function you see it on the right hand side because with time I will not discuss that in too much detail but we do see s signs that there is a reduced mitochondrial metabolism occurring in patients during rest suggesting that also the ATP production capacity is reduced. Now we always thought that well the microclot theory is an interesting uh, theory to that can explain our results. So, as you may know, a group in South Africa suggested that these microclots accumulate in the blood. And as you can see on the right hand side, they can block capillaries. So that was the sort of easy theory that we had is can these clots that we see in, this, in the blood, can they block capillaries and therefore resulting in some sort of hypoxia or reduced flow afterwards? So the first question that we actually had was, OK, let's see if we can find evidence of of these clots um, accumulating in blood vessels in skeletal muscle that can explain the fatigue. 
So we use the same method as they used in, in South Africa and stained our skeletal muscle biopsies for these, um, uh, for these, these microclots. And these are the images that we got. So in purple, you see the cell membrane of the, of the muscle. So you see the nice muscle type of structure. And in green, you see the microclots. These microclots, they accumulate inside the tissue. And if we, if we um, quantify this, we do see that at baseline, before the induction of post absorption malaise, we see there are higher levels in the patients in red compared to our control. However, it's not black and white. It's not that all our patients are so much higher compared to our controls. And that's also something that we see in the blood, in the blood measurements, that there is a bit of overlap between the patients and controls. Uh, one day after the induction of post association malaise, we do tend to see an increase in both the patients as well as in the controls in this amount of clots. But you can also see there is a bit of variability in patients in the response of this. Importantly, um, what we what we see is in the bottom, you see the same images again, but then zoomed in. In blue now is the cell membrane. In pink are the capillaries or the lymph vessels on the right-hand side. And in green, you see those clots again. If you look closely, you don't see any of those clots inside capillaries. And we searched for hours and hours behind our microscope and we could not find any evidence of these clots inside capillaries. capillaries. So we don't actually think that these are able to block capillaries, but somehow they may end up inside the tissue, outside the capillaries. If they are produced there, or if they accumulate there after exercise, we do not know. We also don't know what the link is with, with, um, with symptoms. Do you feel these clots? Do patients that have more severe uh, the COVID-19 of long COVID, do they have more clots? Or is there some sort of relationship between the two? We don't have any idea right now what the functional reason is of these clots. Next one. So when we, 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 when we got these muscle biopsies, we already spotted pretty early onwards some strange things occurring in these, muscle, in these, in these, in these biopsies. And we, we send our, all our biopsies to our local pathologist to see whether we could find any pathological features in skeletal muscle in these patients. And indeed, what you see here is that we do get ideas of atrophy, so atro super small atrophying fibers suggesting denervation. We do see them more often in the, in the patients compared to the controls. But importantly, we also spotted even before the induction of of the post assertion malaise, that in some, some patients, we see uh, like signs of necrosis and internal nuclei, which are signs of regeneration. So the, we, we do think that depending on the size, we, we may have missed the, the, the exact um, 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 like size of, this, of this, this, this problem, but we do see that particularly after exercise, this amount of necrosis increases dramatically in the in our in our patients. So we do see signs of, of, of muscle damage, but also regeneration. So there's also some sort of regenerative process occurring after exercise and in, in particular in patients to, to regenerate the tissue again. Lastly, we wanted to understand whether this end whether the, the, the viral persistence would play a, a role in this. And interestingly, we, we spotted that uh, indeed our tissue had signs of nucleocapsid protein, which is inside the, um, the virus. So it's not the spike protein, which is on the, on the, on the outside of the virus, but we, we stay in particular a protein inside the virus that um, when we know, okay, there is not any link with vaccination status or so. And actually what we spotted is that virtually all participants had some signs of these nucleocapsid protein inside our skeletal muscle. But there was no group effect. So the white and the red bars are very similar, but also no time effects. So there isn't really any, any difference occurring there. The thing was that maybe here is important to remember is that our healthy controls generally, generally were um, uh, 
that it infected at a later time point compared to the long COVID group that has they were infected very early onwards in the in the pandemic. But we don't see any any signs that this could explain or or that the, that the virus virus itself can explain the occurrence of post surgical malaise. Maybe a response to it by the immune system, but that's something we don't know. So to conclude, um, we we think that um, there are different things contributing to um, excess, the reduced excess capacity and post-exertion malaise in patients. So the contribution of exercise, the reduced excess capacity, I should say, intolerance can be interpreted as being intolerant to exercise. So it's, it's, maybe it's the fatigue that we need that we need to mention here the lower respiration, glycolytic fibers, and some smaller fibers under our, may contribute to, to general feelings of fatigue. But very rapid changes in the, met the metabolome, the, uh, the, 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 the damage markers, as well as maybe the tissue infiltration of with amyloid containing deposits, these, these microclots, they can, they can be so rapid that they can explain or contribute to the development of post-exertion malaise. So what are the take home message? I think it's important to realize that, that post-exertion malaise is a critical and serious symptom that really limits daily life uh, and, and work of patients. We do see some peripheral alterations that help can help to explain the fatigue and muscle pain, but we don't know the exact X factor yet that causes all these changes. We do see that they are changing, but we don't know how they, are, how they have come about. We also, because we also know, for instance, that neurological and immunological changes are, are reported in patients. And we, we don't know whether they are changed with acute exercise and how that can also change brain function or, or neurolog neurological functions. So we do think that exercise is counterproductive when the intensity is above the PEM induction threshold. But we do encourage, of course, exercise below this threshold. We know that exercise generally is good, but not when you go above this this unknown, also on the day-to-day -day or, or patient-to-patient -patient basis threshold. And our work, I think, is in, in, is in accordance with, with the work that we are doing uh, and other people are doing in MECFS patients. So what are the future, what are the future work in our group? Maybe interesting to, to see where we are right now. So we want to really understand the similarities and differences between uh, patients with long COVID and MECFS. And for that, we tested another 25 uh, patients with MECFS, and we're currently analyzing them. Maybe there are subgroups of patients with post-viral conditions, so, that, so some groups are maybe different to others. We don't know. We're also trying to see what the contributions are of physical inactivity. Um, and for that, we can compare our data set with an other paper that we've recently published uh, on a strict bed rest study. And maybe you can also uh, detect some markers for uh, the PEM thresholds and related crash and recovery period. So we're trying to uh, do a study uh, on this right now in the Netherlands to do to look at the availability or the applicability of heart rate variability in this. And of course, treatments, that's always something that people are interested in. And I think that's what we all are aiming towards. And of course, we do have some ideas that we're currently uh, preparing in, um, um, in, our, in, our, in our lab and together with the hospital and, and local um, um, communities. So uh, just to get a quick acknowledgement about the translation research, it's a lot of work, but it's fun. Uh, but really um, important uh, thing is to, to highlight the, um, the people that contributed to this uh, and the funders, um, such as the ICANN CME, uh, Patient-Led Research Collaborative, and uh, SolveME, and you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a terrific overview of the work you're <clears throat> undertaking, really important. Um, the first question, I'm, I'm not sure it was um, within the... Um, boundaries of the uh, the study that you've uh, been talking about. But the question is about um, microclots and swelling in the legs. Um, um, <clears throat> did you look at that at all uh, in terms of swelling as a symptom and uh, any therapies that are recommended uh, beyond compression socks and perhaps a relationship with exercise? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, microclots, um, um, they do accumulate. But we don't see any signs of of um, of edema in these muscle fibers. So we took a muscle biopsies, and we typically see edema as as round, swollen cells. Sometimes you see them here, here on the uh, on the bottom 
bottom right, this is, for instance, a very roundish cell that, and also here, they can be uh, interpreted as 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 being a little bit um, 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 eudemic, eudemic. However, we do not see any signs or, or any direct links between the the occurrence of eudema formations or swelling and the the location of these clots. Um, mm. So we don't really. I don't think that these clots can are blocking the perfusion and therefore therefore block or accumulating uh, local water uh, deposition muscle. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, Can you please share your recommendations on HRM and pacing with POTS and I think with PEM as well? <clears throat> Sorry, how to determine upper HR threshold if CPET isn't being done? And also, at what point would you increase the threshold, and by how much? Oh, this is a very good, a very good and difficult question. Uh, so, heart rate variability is the. Uh, we don't really know um, whether there is a there is a specific uh, limit for this. And I think I'm. You know, we, this is really a new area for us to to dive into. Um, uh, and it looks to me that there is a that this is all very individually based. Is that you cannot say like across the board a value over this is going to relate to that. Um, uh, and the same for pots. We are also don't really know what the, the the limits are and how we would interpret results um, with heart rate variability. The only thing is that 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 we are trying to find out is whether on the longitudinal basis patients can 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 track their own heart rate variability using a, using a smartwatch. And maybe that gives us a, a better indication of, of, of when the PEM occurred and how that affects their, their, their heart rate variability, uh, whether there's a change occurring. But we don't really know how to, how, but it's too early days essentially to say anything specific about this. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, do you or do you plan to uh, look at the role of hormones on uh, PEM? I ask because many people note a worsening of symptoms before or around their periods. Mm. Oh, that's an interesting one. I've never realized that that this could worsen around um, or it changes with the menstrual cycle. That's an interesting thought that I've never heard of before. Um, but we do know, of course, that, well, we at least think that there is some sort of link with cortisol production. But unfortunately, in our work, we don't really see much uh, uh, occurring, obviously occurring with cortisol. But maybe if we look more deeper and more and better, we do pick up differences with hormones and hormonal changes. Um Yeah, the short answer is uh, it's not planned in the in the, in in the in the direct uh, near on the near future, so to say. But I'm happy to collaborate on any project that do look at this, of course. Yeah. Good. Thanks. There is a suggestion of somebody in the chat there. Yeah. Um. Sorry, my... I see a lot of uh, chat message. Uh, so if I stay yeah. a bit long afterwards, I can also uh, also uh, respond to the chat messages myself. Oh, that'd uh, be great. <clears throat> okay. Um, another question, how long on average did the members with PEM have long COVID before the fiber type pre-exercise was measured? Was it several years? <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's a good, that's a good question. So, um, um, so there is a, okay. The long COVID group had on average, I think a year and a half of problems uh, before they got continued, they got in included in the study. Now, you, this I know where the question comes from because, of course, people think that physical inactivity can can make your fiber type shift towards more um, or less oxidative fibers. The problem is a little bit that we that we do these these studies also in in strict bed rest and. In strict bed rest, we don't see any change in fiber type whatsoever. So, although we think that 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 of course physically these people may become more physically inactive if they have the disease, mm -hmm. we don't think that the change that we see in our results are just due to the physical inactivity. 
there is an additional role of something else occurring because in physical inactivity, fiber type changes do not typically occur. And also they are changeable really rapidly upon exercise um, um, or return to exercise, essentially. Exercise is medicine in that case. And also there you see that fiber types would change back or a wood chain, or no, no mitochondrial density would change when you start exercising again. Um, but yeah, there, there is, so the short answer is they were a year and a half into the disease, but fiber type shifts, you would not be um, explained by simple physical inactivity. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned that you're currently doing work with MECFS uh, groups, but um, mm -hmm. can you comment on whether or not we currently know uh, that they're showing or not similar patterns of changes in their muscles? Yeah, well, that's of course one thing that I I was was, was thinking about that that this could uh, this could pop up. Um, we are we just literally finished last week with the last biopsies uh, of for this study, and this first day we take in the last blood samples. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we don't really know yet uh, much of the results, but the initial results suggest to us that that MECFS is a sort of a longer longer version of long COVID. Long COVID is relatively short, three to four years, right now. But most patients with MECFS have have got the disease for much longer, and we think that that's really worsens their 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 symptoms and their and their and their tissue um, 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 characteristics. Okay. Thank you. We'll carry on for say five more minutes if uh, people would like to stay um, yep. and uh, and we'll just work through the questions and uh, we can also have a look at the questions afterwards. If there's things that you would like to share afterwards, we can put a note with the uh, posting. Thank you. Um, so based on the potential mechanism causing the worsening of symptoms after exercise, is it possible that individuals who don't seem to have PEM could be worsening their symptoms or ability to proper properly heal post COVID infection? I think I mean that there that's the the comment here is probably important here. So so we we really like only included patients in our study that were that had PEM or post exertion malaise. So if you don't have PEM, um, I mean the comment the uh, you know the first comment here is 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 actually less relevant because we think that if you do not have PEM induction, essentially. You know, exercise is likely going to be beneficial and it's going to be useful for 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 recovery. Um, of course, that's something that 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 patients will have to discover for themselves if there is a if there is you know there's if there is a very high threshold, for instance, for for PEM induction. Um, but if there is, if you, I mean, we we went to the maximum exercise capacity of maximum exercise uh, of these patients. If you stay below that threshold, um, then you know we think that that can be that that can still be safe for patients. Yeah. Okay. The quest, next question is um, uh, about viral persistence and about um, the extent to which it, immunological issues are addressed. Is that part of your work or a different area, or is there overlap there? Yeah. So that's a very good point because. I think the issue with viral persistence is that yes, the virus can be there and stay there, but it may well be that the immune system reacts differently to these to these viral uh, um, remnants that we think are there. Um, the so we do have uh, white blood cells from our, um, uh, our 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 cohort, and we're currently also looking into changes in these in the white blood cells um that occur one you know before versus after one day after exercise and uh, there's been a recent study about this and they do see changes in the in the in the white blood cell composition and their function so we do think there is a there's definitely something happening in, in the immune system but we don't really know whether that is going to cause all the problems that we see um that's something that that we simply don't know okay um, uh, someone wondering about um, uh, cherry angiomas on their torso, torso and legs. Is this a sign of new capillaries forming or small capillaries that are being damaged and amyloid uh, microclots found in muscle tissue? Is there any relationship there? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, I mean, I think our, our future work uh, list was too short in that sense. 
uh, because we're also looking at endothelial dysfunction. And that's something that we are um, they're currently also investigating. Um, we do see signs that, that, that there is at least a contribution of the endothelial cells in this. Um, whether the formation of new blood vessels relates to, to, to this, uh, I don't know. Uh, I also don't know if the if they would relate to the uh, the microclots because we don't typically see those microclots inside the capillary. So I don't know if that will be causal. Uh, there there will be a causal link there. Oh. I cannot hear you anymore. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how does the metabolomic changes uh, correlate with the work of Dr. Jeremy Nicholson at the National Phenome Lab? That's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know what they showed and whether uh, the, the changes that we see are are similar. I can put a slide up here. Um, I mean, these are the the metabol metabolomic changes that we see in, in our cohort. Um, I'm not. I'm not aware of. Of the study that's that's that this participant or this uh, question uh, um, refers to, um, so yeah, I cannot answer that question, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, someone wondering whether whether there was a correlation between the number of infections that people had infections and the the alterations that you saw and observed. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. Uh, the the issue is a little bit that we can only detect. Or, or write down the initial infection and the initial problems. We but we don't know what when our subsequent infection when subsequent infection happened because sometimes these infections occur without any actual symptoms. So, of course, patients participants do not necessarily need know when they get reinfected. Um, if you do get tested on a day to day basis, then yes, you would have known. That's what we we do have some signs for this, but we. Um, we don't know from all participants when the last infection was because that can be a silent infection. Okay, thank you. I think we'll take two more questions and then uh, and then we'll have to end there. Um, mm -hmm. Could your results become markers of long COVID? Do you think you'll we'll do the experiment on more patients? Yes, of course. So we, we the important factor here is that we don't know this additional X factor that caused the change that we see. So. Of course, there is going to be some sort of factor that is making long COVID different from other diseases. Now, we do know, of course, that long COVID and MECFS share a common factor, which is a viral infection. Um, so it doesn't have to be specifically uh, COVID related, um, but it can well be that there is some sort of signature in the blood or in, or or uh, or in the tissue that. That's, that can be used for diagnosis of either PEM or for patients. And of course, that's something that we are looking for uh, in the future too, but that's super difficult to pick out this one factor that is changing that can cause all these alterations. And it can well be that in some patients, patient populations, another something else becomes more um, prominent, so to say, because they have more neurological and immunological symptoms and other, pe other patients have more skeletal muscle changes. So it can well be that there is a, there are more than, there's more than one factor essentially that causes these, uh, the changes that we see in patients. Good. Uh, many more questions, but I'll end with one just about um, uh, your thoughts. As at the end of your uh, presentation, you mentioned that you do have some thoughts on treatments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Um, yes, that's something. Of course, we we are we are we 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 read the literature and we know you know what's going on in the field. Um, the issue is a little bit that as soon as I tell that that this is going to be our uh, you know our, our, our one of our treatment options. Um, I get another thousand emails in my inbox one from patients wanting to want to wanting to uh, participate in studies like this. Um, so we have some ideas of, of where where we can go. <clears throat> um, we're talking also to some from pharmaceutical companies for repurposed purpose me medicines. Um, but this is really something that that requires a large team um, with you know clinicians with uh, pharma companies with you know additional. Um, um, uh, ethical approvals and study designs and, and there's that this is not a trivial thing uh, trying trying a treatment um, of course an option would be to see whether we can 
specifically treat PEM, so make it shorter to make the PEM shorter, but also to increase the thresholds. And that's, of course, something that, that we would be, you know, focusing on um, because we don't have this X factor yet that we can, where we can really say we need to target this X factor and that it will solve all problems of, 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 of long COVID. Right. Well, we'll have to end it there. There's many, many comments, many thank yous no. to both of you, and I'll just add mine. Thank you for staying a bit later, and in particular with the time it is in the Netherlands now, but uh, uh, Dr. Rob Wust and Dr. Robbie Neulat, thank you very much. This was terrific. Yeah. Can I, can I just, uh, I can stay a bit longer to see what the comments are and see whether there's any any leftover and change that we I can answer on the chat. But I think if you close it, there will be, the chat will also close. Um, so so maybe... I can leave it open for five more minutes um, yes, exactly. and then uh, uh, allow you to go through the chat. That would be terrific. And I will ask you now, there's been several questions about asking if uh, people could have the slides in addition to the recording. So you can let me know that uh, following the, the end of this. So thank you very much. That's terrific. So we'll let most of you go. If anybody wants to hang around, that's terrific. I will keep it open for five more minutes. Have a great rest of day. Thank you.